Um, welcome class. This is the first time we've kind of done something like this and it's very cool. It came about um, largely from this discussion forum topic where we were talking about handedness. Um, and we had this idea of maybe, well, I don't know as much as I'd like to know, and, but I know people who know things. And luckily, one of my, well, fellow graduate students, we went to graduate school together, um, Professor Daniel Voyer, who's now at University of New Brunswick, um, he agreed uh, to have a chat with us about handedness and uh, basically lateralization more generally. So I kind of went through your side dish um, or, or your discussion forum and, and pulled out a few questions. And I want to just ask Dan and see what he thinks. So I've got, got the questions listed over here. I don't want to cut off Dan's face, though. Let me. <laughs> That's okay. You didn't no, no, lose no. anything. No, 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 no. <laughs> there we go. That'll work. All right. So so let me just kind of go through these. And the, and the first one is, yeah, um, we, we know there's this weird thing where right-handed people seem to have strongly lateralized brains. Um, but why? What, what, is there any reason why lateralization is seen as any kind of benefit? Or what do we know about that? Okay, well, it, there's two questions in there. Okay, the, the, the idea that there'd be a benefit to lateralization is essentially sharing functions for the brain, that you devote resources uh, in specific areas of the brain to specific functions, and that allows to do more efficient job. But also there's a point of communication in the corpus callosum where they actually share the information and they can synchronize. Right. Uh, I could go on forever about this. There's, there's actually an old book that's been published recently called The Master and His Emissary. And he, the book's about the topic that the role of the hemispheres might be uh, a, a little messed up nowadays, but uh, that uh, we're giving more role to the left than we should because uh, of the way the world has evolved, but in reality, the the master is the right, and the emissary, the the, the mouthpiece, yeah. is the left. So they're working together, and they both have a job. So the right would be more looking at the big picture, and the left would be more passing the message and doing the more close things. Oh. So it makes us a complete person. Yeah. Well, that's kind of interesting. But what then, okay, so if we think of left-handed people then being less lateralized, is the implication then that they are at a disadvantage somehow because they're not most efficiently using their brain? Well, whether left-handed people are actually left lateralized for debate, uh, oh, yeah? I know there's been a meta-analysis that was published recently where I think they found a link that yes, maybe left-handed people are, are less lateralized than right-handed people. But I know in my own research, I always do an analysis. I, I used to only test right-handers because we thought it was messy to put them together. That, so we wanted to, to keep handedness a constant in our design. And lately I've included both left and right-handers and I do an analysis with and without the left-handers and it changes nothing. So. I can, I'm starting more and more to look like maybe they're not that different, but it might be the task that I use. If you use more, well, I don't know more precise the word, but more radical tasks like um, uh, sodium amyobarbital testing. I don't know if your students would be aware of that. That's you true. inject a, 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 right? an ST in, in the carotid artery and, and you put one part of the brain to sleep. That's where you see the differences. That's where you see clearly there's about 80% of uh, of left-handers that would lose language for an injection to uh, to uh, the left artery and 95% of right-handers. So that's where you see the big difference. So it's probably true. Okay, I haven't answered the question. Why? It, there's more than one factor. Do you have many hours to talk about this? <laughs> I would expect that for starters, uh, one of the expl explanations we might talk about is that if you're left-handed, there's already been some evidence showing that your attention will be biased to the left side anyway. So when information is presented to the left, you will tend to attend to it first compared to information presented to the right. And then that might actually bias what information, where it's processed, uh, for example. Okay, so just the way that the visual system and the auditory system are organized. And so to that point, as you, you did enough research on attention to know 
about attention. I won't lecture you on that. You can tell a lot about that in your class, sure. I'm sure, in your own time. Um, but it really would be an attentional effect for start. I, now, I think that's a cool logic, point. It's a cool point to say that you know it's not just whether your hand is dominant, but actually the way you perceive the world and experience the world is also a function of this. So I think that's very of cool. Of course, yes, yeah. yes. And, and, but it might be also, like I just talked at this point about it be a top-down effect of attention, but then that be it bring back bottom up effect bottom up effect because you pick up that information that's presented on one side or the other, and then it's kind of like some kind of feedback loop that it, it feeds itself that way. Yeah. So that's one thing. Okay, maybe left handers are, are less uh, lateralized, but when we look at it behaviorally, that might work like that. When you look at I talked about the sodium amobarbital test, yeah. then that would be well, we don't have attention here, it's all neurological. And you can start looking at connections, for example, left handers, it seems that they have better interhemispheric communication if you look at density cells in the uh, in the corpus callosum and even the size of it. Um, so I mean where does it come from? That's another story, but there's actually both functional or, or cognitive effects as well as neurological effects that might account for that difference. That's really cool. So left-handers actually have a denser corpus callosum, the, the hemispheres. Well, I read that somewhere. Of course, next week there could be a paper <laughs> published that'll say that it's totally wrong. Yeah, but, replication but is I important. Know. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's cool. So every time we talk about this, kind of sneaking to the third question here, every time we talk about this, people will pull out stories and say, um, well, I'm neither really right or left-handed. I, I do this right-handed. I do that left-handed. I do... And, and they're not claiming to be ambidextrous. They're not saying I'm equally good with both. They tend to instead say, depending on the context, I seem to be either right or left-handed. Um, so is, is this common, and, and is there any link to lateralization? Uh, given what we talked about right and left-handed, I'm, I'm suspecting you'll say we don't know, but... Uh. <laughs> uh, my favorite questionnaire is the Waterloo Handed Questionnaire that was put together by Supervisor Phil Bryden. Yeah. Any two items, and each item is a question, so like which hand you use to brush your teeth, which hand, which hand will you use to throw baseball. There's even that kind of weird question, which hand will you use to to throw a javelin, like we do that every day. But anyway, <laughs> but my point I use your, I use is you have to think about it. We always ask people, think about doing the activity. Yeah. My point here is that, okay, handedness is something, it, it's not like one or the other. And you could be completely left-handed, you do everything with the left hand. You could be completely right-handed, do everything with the right hand. But most people are somewhere in the middle. In the studies that I conduct, I tend to give that questionnaire. And I don't find that many people with extreme scores. I find people that are like somewhat in the middle. Myself, I, I took that test uh, a while back, but I still remember that I was very close to zero, but toward left-handed. But I know I write with my left hand. Yeah. So writing hand is often used as a very good predictor of handedness because it's a fairly solid it correlate to the overall uh, with the overall score but it's not the whole story so the the point here is that it's very difficult for people to do one thing well with the left hand another thing well with the right hand other things they can do well with both hands and you know you play guitar you don't have a choice you have to adapt yeah. so there are things maybe not as well as you'd like i know i'm the same but, <laughs> but it's really um it's really some activities you need both hands so you don't have a choice and you have to become proficient so it just tells us you can learn yeah and i know i know there's another question that you're going to ask me well yeah <laughs> so i'm kind of giving you a leading in on that okay so let, 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 let's skip four because i'll come back to four and leave it to the end but yeah so we have these people that that are born one hand and it was especially common i think back um many years ago when left-handers were viewed, I don't know, uh, <laughs> in some less than optimal way. And so if your parents or your teachers found out you were left-handed, they would try to turn you into a right-handed person. Um, and so one of the, and there's a lot of people in the course who've had that sort of experience. And, and I think they're wondering um, about, are there, does this relate to their brain in any way? Um, if, they, if they were left, but now they've become right, 
Um, and and is is there any reason why they became left or right in in the first place? So so how does somebody become a left or right hander? Well, we'll start with that, and then we'll yeah, okay. start with what happens if you're forced to to do something. So there's um. As you might imagine, there's a few theories about how you become left and right-handed, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you more the, the more commonly accepted one. There, there's one that it was hormonal and it was supposedly happening all in your during your station, and that, but there was also genetic aspects, and the hormonal part's pretty well down, like caput. Uh, is being criticized to death, so I'll leave it alone. It's 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 already sad enough as it is. <laughs> the genetic view, though, is still alive and it's it's going strong, and people are still working on it. And one of the the contenders is that there might be actually two genes that determine hand preference, and that there'd be one that basically it's like the hand preference gene, but there's another one that's a chance gene. And it can switch either way. And now we don't quite understand how it switches. But so you can have cases, for example, where you have, I, I'm going to cheat and you send me the questions ahead of yeah, time. Yeah, and yeah. you mentioned that example. And I like that example because identical twins, you expect they have the same exact same genetic makeup. But you might have one that's left-handed left -handed and one that's right-handed. And that would just be that chance gene. But, you know, it's just a theory. There's support for it. If you look at patterns of handedness in families, they tend to fit. Like handedness tends to run in families. I can think about it. My my dad was left-handed. My sister was left-handed. My brother's right-handed. My mom's right-handed. Like yeah, we yeah. can look at it that way, and and certainly encourage your students to think of about it because that would kind of give them an idea. If there's no right-handers in their family and they are left-handers, they shouldn't think maybe the, the mailman was ended. They shouldn't think that. You should think it's probably that chance factor. It has that chance uh, gene that created that. Um, but as you know, we're still, people are still working on the human genome, and maybe at some point they will actually identify these genes. But at this point, that's a contending theory. That's a genetic factor to start with. And but that you can go back. I mean, there's books written about how that evolved in the first place, and why is it that the population is about 90% right-handed and 10% left-handed? Even better, why is it that it's about 12% men are left-handed and 8% of women are are, are left-handed? Like these are things we still have to explain. We still have a lot of work to do and now keep people like me in business. Yeah, cool. <laughs> let me yeah, let me I'm throw so around. I got, a new, I got a new one that I just thought of while you're thinking about it that I know we've all heard, which is the claim that left-handed people are also more creative and it, and it all implies that somehow their right side of their brain is a little more powerful. The master is more of a master, perhaps. Well, I, I have a vested interest in saying that that they're smarter and better looking and more creative because I'm left-handed. I think um, I, I, it's a very interesting question, and I don't know that it's it's uh, grounded in facts. Um, I think that it makes sense because we think, well, supposedly they use their right hemisphere more, and supposedly the the thinking is that the right hemisphere would be more creative and blah blah blah. But in reality, we know now that it's not that compartmentalized like that. We, we look at neuroimaging data and we see, yes, we find these effects, these laterality effects, but there's more to it than that. There's certainly a lateralized component, but we can't say, well, you're left-handed, you use your right brain more. We don't even have evidence for that. And then we don't even have evidence that, that creativity is the exclusive domain of the right hemisphere. So I think yeah. that's another one of these areas. That, that might just be a stereotype. And, yeah. uh, and maybe and we I just know notice yeah. the creative left-handed people and, and sort of highlight those a lot, the Jimi Hendrixes or the or the whatever, and yeah. Yeah, I think it's Leonardo da Vinci, and like you can actually buy mugs. Uh, in San Francisco, there's the left-handed store, and you can buy <laughs> well, mugs with names of famous people. Which brings yeah. up that funny thing. I think it is true 
that the life expectancy of left-handed people, sorry Dan, is, is, is lower, right? That they tend to not survive as long? Yeah, about six months. <laughs> oh, is it, is it literally about six months? Yeah. Yeah, it's about six months, yeah. And there's a lot of expl explanations for that. Of course, as a left-hander, my, my favorite theory is that it's all environmental because we live in a world that's built for for right-handers. And so I do activities. So I'll use a, my, my circular saw, and my hand is closer to the blade than a right-hander's hand would be. Yeah. And that would create uh, a higher risk of accident. So I might die. So I'm very careful around uh, that kind of uh, tools. <laughs> right. Uh, but I think we got sidetracked. There's still yeah. one question that I didn't answer, and that was, what happens to you if uh, you're forced to yes. to change uh, activity? And there's people who do strange things. I know that I had a teacher in uh, in high school that he could go on the blackboard and write his name with both hands, but one hand was writing was writing the mirror image of the other. And I think you mentioned to me yeah. about someone who can write in a different language. That that totally, I, I'm totally amazed by that. Yeah. By the way, I've um, mentioned that to other people, and whoever that student is, if if you could send a little video of yourself doing that with each hand writing in a different language, I think a lot of people would love to just see that. That'd be cool. Oh yeah, yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah. Um, I think what happens with that, okay? But first of all, it it will change you if you force like that to to use a non-preferred hand. And we talked about attention earlier. It probably would affect, in part, if you have an attentional bias, it would, maybe you'd be less biased. But it also, we know there's brain plasticity, and that would affect a bit how connections happen. And it'd be interesting to, for one, these people to give their brain to science, and that we could actually go look at their corpus callosum, or even just a structural MRI on their brain. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of connections and that there would be more connections and people like that. But we don't know. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, start forcing your kids to write with bowed hands. Because on the other hand, other people, I've heard of other people that, that started stuttering as a result of that. And so that it actually kind of confused them to some extent that it mixed the signals. So it can have beneficial effects, but it also can have detrimental effects. Um, you know, we don't understand the brain as well as we'd like. We're working, everybody's working on it. But yeah. but that is really, to me, that's one of those great areas that there would be a lot of research to be done, to go look at people can do that and look inside their brain and, and look at, and we could even look at their personality for all I know and find differences. Yeah, so cool. this one, I, I probably can't give a really satisfactory answer. I think it will affect your, how you, deal with the world, you're processing your cognitive uh, abilities, and but I don't know which way, and I, yeah. and I don't know how. I, I, I find it kind of interesting in a way because, I mean, you can look at the task as asking somebody to, to use the other hand, but you can also look at it as forcing them to inhibit a natural tendency and, and to sort of consciously control something that would normally be unconscious. And of course, I love all this conscious unconscious stuff. But, uh, but I also, yeah, but I also like the idea that, that I wonder if there might be benefits. Um, for example, we will talk about the famous marshmallow experiment at some point. I, I can't, I don't think I've uh, unveiled it on them yet, but the idea of asking children to avoid eating a marshmallow for a period of time, and if they succeed, then you give them an extra marshmallow. But it requires willpower, and there's been a lot of evidence that suggests that the kids that have the stronger willpower are ultimately more successful in life. So I kind of wonder whether it could be a potential for training your willpower and training you to consciously control things, and that could potentially have, have benefits that go well beyond handedness, maybe. Uh, I would agree with that. It's a possibility that, like I mentioned, that there, might, there could be beneficial effects, but it might not work for everybody. That's that, Then we get in the realm of individual differences, and then... This is more. This is my realm, and and uh, there's a lot of points to study in that. Yeah. Uh, and and as we used to say at Waterloo, that's an empirical question. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, All right. Go, go ask the, the right question and go look for answers. I, I think we've covered a lot of great ground. I just I just have this one other question that always has bothered me because I've never had a good answer, and I don't know if there is a good answer. 
But the general fact that the brain seems to have this contralateral organization, where especially in terms of sensory and motor functioning, where the left side of the brain is controlling the right side of the body and vice versa. Why is that? What, what, what's the story on that? I think, again, that's kind of resource sharing. I think that's the best way that, that uh, all I can say is that chances are that's the way it evolved to start with. And then when it's split, humans are one of the few species that have that lateralization of functions. Oh. Uh, okay, like even you consider um, there's been a lot of research done on hand reference in mice, and there's no such thing. The hand, mice will will reach with whatever hand is closer, but humans, you could put a thing on the desk, and give me that pen, and we'll use our preferred hand, even if it's on the other side of our body, oh. just because that's our preferred hand. Yeah. Um, I think so, I've heard that before. I think um, I think it was the only other species was a parrot. I, I think parrots, which are weird in many ways, uh, including their language abilities, which may be linked, but I think they show a hand preference, maybe. They show a hand preference, and they actually, uh, parrots will, um, when they sleep, they leave uh, they leave one eye open at all times. So they keep an eye on things. They only have their brain sleeping. I know I have a parrot, so oh dear. So I've been watching him sleep uh, often and bite my nose a number of times too. But anyway, um, and apparently I don't remember the exact pattern now, but it's it's essentially when uh, that uh, when they look at an object, if it's a threat. The, the assess the threat factor, they will use one eye. And if it's something, if it's uh, food or, or a sexual object, they will use the other eye. So that the brain is lateralized in that way because they also have contralateral connections huh. in that way. So it's, uh, I don't make the ipsy lateral. You know, I, yeah. I don't do research with animals, so that's a little fuzzy in my mind. But I know that they, uh, that they are lateralized and that they handle things differently. They, they will but also sometimes can... show uh, mental disorders too. I, it's it's difficult, I think, to have a parrot as a pet because things like going away on vacation can be very traumatic to a parrot um, and change. Yeah, or general. traumatic to the owners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we take our bird everywhere we go. Really? Uh, <laughs> so uh, so anyway, that's, that's not cool. for this forum. <laughs> um, well, that's good. So, I was saying, I think that, that there's evolutionary and, and cer certainly resource sharing advantages to have that contralateral organization. Yeah. And it keeps things straight. And also, if it was all centralized in one place, if you have a brain injury, you'd lose everything. Yeah. And so this way, there's kind of a, a more or less duplication of the information because there's some control that, that is kind of uh, uh, bilateral. Yeah. But it's not very good. Yeah. yeah. Like in the cerebellum. Uh, but even then, recent research suggests that even the cerebellum has some lateralized connection. So, so we have to follow that story. Cool. Well, Dan, I, I really appreciate the time. Um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Man, I, I think I want to yeah. do this more. <laughs> Thank you for asking me. And uh, I was looking at that question. I think your, your students are very smart. I think they are too. Yeah, they're a great group. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, have a great day. Have a great weekend. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers, man. <laughs>